Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we have a real treat with us today. We have Kenneth Hines, a photographer based out of Atlanta and New York City. And what he's going to share with us today are how he takes, I call them almost ordinary photographs and turns them into just these really compelling images like you were seeing when, we, when you first joined um, with some creative editing and a lot of color and focus. And I'm really excited to dig in with him today and have him share his work. If you have any questions at all, please throw them in the questions area or the chat pod. And um, I think I'm gonna be quiet now and let the star of the show take over. Take it away, Kiana. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you to Kathy and Adobe and the Photo Plus crew. Um, I don't like long introductions about myself or anything. I definitely have a lot of material that I want to get through and especially get to the questions. And so I will go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started here. And I'll stop my video, that way it's not in the way. And there we go, okay. So hopefully everybody can, can see my screen now. And I'm sure there's a way I can remove this out of my way, hopefully. I don't know if you all are seeing that or not, but if it's in the way, let me know. Okay, so I'm gonna show you four images that I have and quite a few of them are very different from one another. And they're going to really show a lot of different um, editing that I'm, I've utilized. Um, in terms of, especially with the brand new color grading, which I'll show you on this specific photo. Now, what I generally like to start with, with any photo that I take is looking at what I have in terms of colors. What does my eye go to when I'm looking at any of my photos? So immediately, everyone always notices the orange hair of this guy. Many people assume that I had changed his hair color. No, that's his actual hair color. And I thought it was very cool looking. Um, he was at one of the newsstands um, down in um, the train station, New York City subway. And just everything around just was so fascinating. And I, and I just had to take this picture. And so my eye straight, goes straight to his orange hair. So that's one of the colors that I know I'm going to focus on. Now look at the whole picture. What are some of the other colors that stand out? That's what I'm looking at that will complement the orange. Well, I see the yellows and I see the reds. So just off of that alone, I know those are pretty much going to be the fundamental co colors that I focus on because his, the subject in the middle, his hair being that orange color, those are the colors that stand out the most, those, those sort of reddish oranges in, in the hues. So I want that to be our focus. Everything else does not matter on our color palette. So what I'm gonna start with is, we're gonna do a few of our basic adjustments here. And I want to bring down my highlights. And at certain points of this video, I know it might look like, what in the world is he doing? Why, like the picture might be going extremely dark or it might be going extremely bright. But I guarantee you, once we're all towards the end, it will come together. So initially, I I'm, I'm want to bring down some of my highlights here. And the next thing, I want to increase my shadows quite significantly. And then I'll also do the same for my white level. And then because something that is a very big sort of trademark to my images is my contrast in black levels in my images. That's how I, you know, the dark tones that I have in my photos. I'm very big on the contrast and those black levels. My style changes quite a bit over time, but for the most part, you're always going to see sort of that, that lingering base when it comes to contrast. And so for my blacks, we're gonna bring that down about there. That looks pretty good to me. And for our texture and clarity, We'll add a little bit in that area. As I, we have a, a significantly sharp photo um, to, that we're starting with, very, very sharp photo. And I wanna emphasize 
a lot of that detail that we have here in our photo. And then for our dehaze, I want to run a little bit of that, gives me a little bit of contrast in, in um, my image, in, in some of the aspects of my, my photos. But I'm actually going to take out the contrast here in this global adjustment. Okay, so once I have that, I'm also going to adjust my white balance a little bit here. So what I'm looking for is something that's kind of rustic like. You know, look, look at the whole scene here. It, it's a lot that's going on. We're in an underground station and I, I really want to, to really have a feel of sort of this vintage type look with our orange and yellows being our dominating colors. And so I really want th that to, to really pop about our photo. Now for our white balance though, we're actually going to decrease the temperature a bit. We're, we're going to go a little bit on the cooler side. And that looks pretty good there. And then I'll take off some of the purple tint here, go more towards the green side there, okay. And then next is one of my, my favorite um, areas is the tone curve. Uh, I'm very big on utilizing this. This is where I really get the look that my images have. And just to kind of show you really quickly of how to go about um, how this can really change the dynamics of, of an image. So here, anywhere on this uh, graph, I can drop little anchor points. So going from left to right, you have your black uh, levels, you have shadows, the middle here would be your midpoint. Uh, then you have your, your highlights and then white point. And so you can drop wherever you want points to be here. Let's say, oh, let's come over here, drop a point here, drop a point there and a point here. So of what I want to adjust to get the, the kind of contrast level, if I want a film like look to an image, I'll take my black point anchor here and I'll bring that up and see how it just kind of turns it into a very uh, vintage film-like image just from doing that one simple adjustment. So the tone curve has a lot of power and you can also do uh, the same within the different color channels uh, for your reds, greens, and blues as well. So it's a, it's a very powerful tool that if you've never tried it, make sure you try that on one of your images. So what I'm going to do is come back over here and I already have some presets that I've made for my tone curve specifically, which differ from the global presets. So it's not adjusting all of the different levels within my image, just the tone curve. And so we're going to use my four train curve here. And then we'll go back to our parametric curve and we'll make some adjustments in our darks and our shadows. So I wanna take my shadows all the way up here and then increase my darks ever so slight. That's good, that's good. And then we'll kind of change our adjustments here. That, that looks pretty good, okay. So then next, remember how I started off with saying, our focus is on those red, orange, and yellows. Well, this is where that's going to take place. And so we're going to take away the colors that we don't care about. So that's the green, that's the aqua, that's the blue, the purple, the magenta. We're taking all of those away and we're just focus, focusing on those three colors. Now, what I want to do is kind of take out of some of the saturation that we have there because we don't want it to be a, a lot of color. We want it a little bit faded because we're going for a, a very kind of grungy old style look. So I'm decreasing the saturation of my orange as well as my yellow level. That looks pretty good. And then for my hue, for our red, we'll go a little bit more on the orange side. And that looks pretty good. So now for our luminance, I want to kind of add a little bit more light, a little bit more emphasis on certain, on those specific colors. So we'll go up to about 30 for our reds, go up quite a bit in our orange and see how the, the hair, see how it started brightening up his hair to where it stands out a little bit more. 
Whereas here, it doesn't really do anything. Your, your attention isn't really on the guy. You're kind of jumping around. But in adding that luminance, we sort of bring back our focus, which is on him, which I want. Everything else is basically like an accessory. And so I also want to do the same for our yellows, add a little bit of yellow in there as well. Now, next is my, I will say it's kind of a, a head to head between color grading and tone curve as far as which is my new, uh, my new favorite, because I really am utilizing color grading quite a bit. But what I'm going to do first is initially start off with what color grading was before this update, which was the old split toning that you all might, might remember. So to get that effect of what split toning was in Lightroom, I'm going to switch my blending and go from 50 to 100. So now it's going to be activated as if I'm adjusting of how split toning used to be. And so I want to adjust my highlights. And so we'll go over to highlights. We'll add a little bit of warmth in our color there and add a little bit of the saturation. There we go. See how we just warmed that photo up just with that one adjustment. And that's all we want to do in color grading for right now. Next thing we'll go to is, now I don't necessarily have to do this. And I've, I've shared with this, uh, I shared about this in a lot of my YouTube tutorials when I'm doing these edits. My picture is already plenty, plenty sharp, but I just always like adding sharpening. That's like a, a trademark of mine. I don't know why, but it's something that I always love doing. And then we'll run a mask about 40, uh, maybe go about 50, which will focus more on our in-focus areas as opposed to the entire image. Um, so like this, this background, we won't be adding as much sharpening on that part of our photo. And that looks pretty good. Noise reduction, don't necessarily have to do. I think this was about ISO 1250. Um, and it's, it's pretty good to me. You don't have to run it. You can if you want to. And then the next thing, we'll come down to our lens correction and enable profile correction. Now, a lot of people assume that my photos are dark, that I make them dark. But as you saw in turning on the profile correction, it's the lens that has the vignetting. And that's what I love about this lens. So I actually, once I do the profile correction, I go back and take that off because I want that because that's something that is a big part of all of the, the photos that I do. So I'm, I'm actually not adding that. That's naturally in the photo. So we're going to leave it there. So the next thing, uh, we don't have to do any of our transform tools. Now we come down to our post crop vignetting. And so we're gonna leave it on highlight priority. Come down to about 26. 30. That looks pretty good. Okay. And then bring my midpoint all the way to zero. And next, what we want to do is bring our highlights to 100. And we're going to feather our vignette and kind of adjust our roundness a bit. And that's, that's it. I don't know if we have any questions with just those um, edits for this specific photo, but here's our before. And there is our after. So see what the, the difference in colors of how we took away those colors and got this sort of vintage looking image that just focuses on three colors. That's it. Kenneth, we don't have any questions right now. I have a comment though. I think this is a really interesting example of how color can completely alter the nature of a photograph. I mean, people that like bright, poppy, vibrant colors could have taken your before image completely the other direction by increasing the saturation and color of the bright, probably oranges, reds, and greens, blues in there. And yet you took it a different way to fix, to fit your eye, which gives it just a completely different look. Color is just so important. I love this image. Thank you for showing us, taking us behind the scenes on how you did it. So I think it's time for you to head into another image. Well, before we do that, so this image, I have a brand new edit that I'm going to show for the first time. 
And it is in going back to our color grading. So this was the first image that I had done of this, this first edit. But with the update to color grading, I took this photo and went a step further because what I wanted to see, what could I do with this new tool that I wasn't able to do before? So with that, let's go back to our color grading and now let's activate it so that way we're getting the, the effects of how this new tool works. So we're going to reset our blending mode back to 50. And now I actually want to make a few other adjustments. So let's go to our shadows. And I actually want to bring down our shadows here ever so slightly. Let's go about 16, around in there. Okay. Then next, I'm going to go to my global adjustment. And just to give a very different effect, watch what happens here. We're going to go about in our greenish, bluish type tones. Now, remember, we took all those colors away. So why would I want to go to those colors when it has nothing to do with the photo at all? Watch what happens when I add the saturation in. It's an entirely different photo just in utilizing this new color grading tool. So if I turn this off, you know, it's, it's going to also take away sort of the split toning look. But that's what we had before. Now look at it with the color grading. You just, I just changed it to an entirely different photo in just two simple adjustments. That's it. So any um, further additives on this, Kathy? <laughs> I don't think so, except... Teresa and I both love your edits. She commented in the chat pod and I had to, I had to agree with her completely. Incredible. <laughs> and thank you for show, showing the new color tools um, that came out last fall that I think people maybe aren't aware of that, again, make a big difference. Thank you. It, it really does. And, you know, I'm sure there are people that probably do miss having split toning, but it's split toning 2.0, basically. Because if you, again, if you still want to have split toning as before, just take your blending to the 100. It's going to function the same way. But you have this new global addition, as well as this new midtones, which just add so many new ways of where you can pull and push an image. That's what I love about it. So let's fly from New York City virtually to Chicago. And this is a photo that I thoroughly have enjoyed. And um, I thought would be something fun. Gives you kind of that aspect of, of sort of street architecture, kind of blended together. Um, a photo of a one of the Chicago elevated trains going through an S curve. And so we're going to do some fun stuff with this one. So what I want to do first, however, is let's run our transform tool and straighten that photo up a little bit. Okay, and come back to the top. So where we're going with this one. Now I had a version of this where there was a little bit less shown in the highlights. And a lot of people in, in this situation would expose for highlights. But our cameras these days, and especially these lenses, um, like this image was taken with a, a Zeiss Bodice 25 millimeter, which is a very good lens. And I think this was taken with the Alpha 9, it's only Alpha 9. And there's so much data that I get in these raw images to where I don't have to expose for the highlights and I can just take the photo normally as is. I don't have to, um, you know, I don't, I don't like exposing for highlights and bringing up shadows because what that does is introduces noise when you do that. And that's something that I don't want to do for my photos. So this might look kind of blown to some people, but watch what happens. So we're gonna start with taking out our highlights again. Look at how we just brought back some of those, those clouds showing in our photo because that data is there. As long as you don't clip the highlights, you're okay. You're okay. And you don't have to worry about exposing for your highlights and then bring it in into Lightroom and increasing the shadows. Now, of course, program is good enough. These cameras are good enough. You can do that. I just wouldn't advise it. 
So we're going to add a little bit in shadows. We're going to also add a little bit in our whites. And then remember, my signature is those black levels. We're going to decrease our blacks here. And then I want to exaggerate some of those, those edges. So we're going to add a little bit of clarity in there. Okay, and it looks pretty good. And then next we'll come down to our tone curve. And so we'll go back to my point curve. And this time I'm going to use my point portrait strong curve. And just gives me a little bit more, more contrast in there. But why use a, a one that I have listed as portrait? Because the contrast level isn't as harsh and I don't want it as harsh for this, this particular photo. And so, so once we have that, we'll come back over to our parametric curve and increase our shadows here. That looks good. And then next, our hue, saturation, and luminance. Now, once again, what is the dominating color here that we have? Blue. So that's what my eye goes to when I'm editing. I'm looking at the dominating color. So I see my blues, and then I also see, you know, the, the streak of the train going through the S-bin. I have that red there. So those are the two colors that I'm gonna be focusing on. So let's uh, make some adjustments here. We'll do a little bit of adjusting in our red. Maybe go a little bit more orange for our orange hue. Um, adjust more towards the green side on our yellow. Uh, for our aqua, let's go a little bit more on the sort of green side of that. And for our blue, we'll also kind of bring that over as well. So for our purple magenta, I don't think we really have much that's there. It's a little bit, it's a little bit. So we'll adjust some of that. Okay, that looks good. Now saturation. We're kind of going opposite this time from the last image where we were taking color away. Well, this time we're adding a little bit and adding some saturation. So we're add adding quite a bit in our red, a little bit in the orange, as well as our aqua and our blue. Yeah, it looks, kind of looks like a watercolor painting in a way. <laughs> so then we'll also, kind of exaggerate, bring up some of the, 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 the light in our like red color that's not as bright as our blue because it, it's kind of controlling of our photo. So let's bring up in, in our luminance some of that red. And then we can actually bring down a little bit of the blue. That looks pretty good. I think that looks good. Okay, next, we're actually skipping color grading, no color grading on this image this time. So it's a little bit different. Uh, we'll maybe run a little bit of sharpening. I always do it. Like I said before, I don't have to, I just do it. Because as you see, we have a very, very sharp photo as is, very sharp photo. So it's not necessary, I just do it. Um, and then we'll run some lens correction. And as I said before, we're gonna turn that that uh, vignetting kind of down. I actually take it all the way out. Let's do that. That looks, looks pretty good there. And then next we will go to our effects and add my favorite, that post crop vignette. So we'll start that off about 40, 38, that works. Bring our midpoint all the way down. Now see how ultimately dark we got, but watch, we're gonna bring all that back. We are, we are. Let's feather that and we'll bring that all the way to a hundred. And then we'll also bring in some of our highlights. Now I don't wanna go too much. I don't wanna have a totally bright area in just one corner like that. So we won't add as much back there. Okay. So next, what I want to do, adding another new element that we didn't see in the last um, image and that's our radio filter. So I, I like where we are with the image, but it's a little too dark over in this area. And I just want to bring that up a bit to add a little bit of, of depth with our shadow area that's there on the side. So let's bring in our radio filter here. And we're going to 
just start it right there and do a very, very big circle there. Now, one thing that why I use this, I could use an adjustment brush and just highlight that area if I wanted to. The reason I don't is because street and architecture, it's a little bit more forgiving. So it doesn't matter if it overlaps into certain areas. It doesn't. If I'm dealing with people, that kind of changes things to where, yeah, I might need to pinpoint it a little bit, take my adjustment brush. But for something like this, we can just take the radial filter and it does perfectly fine. So we'll reset our exposure there. And what I'm going to do is add a little bit in exposure and then we'll increase our shadows there. About, eh, maybe about 15. Your, your guess as far as how much you wanna add to, to a specific area, but just enough so that way you can tell we have some windows, we have some buildings, we have some cars on the street. You can actually see that there's a street down there. It's totally up to you as far as how much shadows you add, but that, that just gives you a general idea. Say if I wanted to do a little bit in this area too, well, all I do is just right click here, we'll duplicate that, and I'll just drag that over to this area. And we can make it a little smaller because we don't have as much area that I would want to correct over here. So we can make it a little smaller. And okay, and that looks pretty good. So that's our before and that's our after. And if you notice here, we actually kind of stayed a little bit true to the original this time and just took what was already there and just, just emphasize and, and exaggerate it a little bit more. So any questions that we may have on that one or any intriguing comments? Yeah, we have, we have some questions. Um, first, David asked, what were your camera settings when you shot this photo? My camera settings, okay. So we have the Sony Alpha 9. I shot that at F14, uh, six second exposure. So 25 millimeter and an ISO 50 image. And this was taken with a um, ND filter. I believe I was using a three stop ND maybe or a six stop dark circular polarizer breakthrough filters. All righty, it's nice to have that metadata right there with the image, isn't it? Lightroom makes it easy, doesn't it? <laughs> we try, we try. Um, another question, Patrick asked if you're going to, on, are you gonna be showing tone, do, doing more with tone curves on um, any of your other examples? Yes, we will. You? Every, okay. All okay. the other images, we will be using the tone curve. Perfect. Those were the only questions that came up. Oh, Teresa has a good one. All right, Kenneth, um, once you like this image and you'd like to save that look that you've created, how would you save that as a preset? That's a good question. Okay, so as you saw, so kind of going to Patrick's kind of question about the tone curve, I'll tie kind of like a part of his into this answer. So because I, if I have a, a tone curve that I've set, so if I've gone over here and set my, my, my points, my anchors here on my graph, and I like what I have here. So just to kind of show you, because I can't do it now because it already has one saved. But if I make an adjustment, you see it'll say custom for your point curve. You can save presets over here as well. You don't have to tie them to a specific preset if you don't want to. So all you do is go in here and this new option, pops up when you make adjustments to where you can save it. So you just save it like you normally would any other preset. And so those will live over here. So they're kind of detached from the actual preset if you want them to. Um, you can mix and match. You know, If you use a preset and wanna have a different tone curve, you can very well do that. So say I want it to go to, uh, let, let's do a vintage look on this one. Let's go to the four train curve. Watch what happens. Look how I just made that a faded, kind of image, but I haven't adjusted anything else. I'm just adjusting the tone curve. So you can save those as a preset as well. But if I have this look and I say, oh, you know, this, this looks pretty good. I will come up to my develop um, option here on my, my toolbar at the top. And you can see where it says new preset. So once you have new preset, you can 
either create a new group or place it someplace where you already have presets already made. So in this instance, you can name it. Now, the way that I go about my naming, and this people find this as an interesting quirk about me and how I do photography. I actually name it something that is related to this specific photo. Why is that? Well, I'll do an example. So Chicago elevated blue tone. And then I also will put uh, a, a sort of a um, acronym for my tone curve. So that way I know what it is too. So I'll put this one or I in the event that I come back to this and I make a variant of it, I just build off of it. So I put one and then I'll put PSC to let me know that's portrait strong curve. I know what, what um, tone curve I use specifically for that photo. So once I save that, it's there. But of how I adjust that tone curve and use this one. Now I'm gonna go back, create a new preset and Chicago elevated uh, blue tone two, and now we have four TC to tell me, okay, I changed that and use a different tone curve. So that's, that's how I go about doing that. And so as you can see, my presets all live over here on the, the left side. There's about 2,800 presets and I know exactly what every last preset does to where I never have to think about it because of how I named them. I remember every photo that I've taken. So I, I know exactly what look has what I'm kind of envisioning, but I can build off of it in the event that I haven't really created the look that I'm looking to get from an edit. Okay, that right there is pretty extraordinary to have 2,800 presets and understand what they all mean, which says a lot about your naming convention and how wise that is to do so. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm that's my tip so far for the day for me to take away with presets. Um, Eileen asks, how much time do you typically spend doing edits on an image? So in showing what you all have seen so far, this is kind of a, a little bit a longer version just because I'm talking through and, and showing what things do. But I don't spend a lot of time. And the reason why is because I've been editing for so many years. I've now gotten my style to where I can finally create what I see in my mind. Whereas before, it would probably take me maybe a half an hour sometimes, maybe even longer to do just one photo. But now to go through a set of images, I usually maybe take a couple of minutes at the very most because I, I know what I, I want before I've even taken the photo. I have to see what the image looks like in my mind before I ever take the frame. But once I've taken the frame and I saw it in my mind what that image looks like, I know exactly what the edit is. I can just come into Lightroom and do what, what it is that I want to do for that specific photo to where it doesn't take a lot of time. And it takes time to actually get to that sort of level of understanding the type of style that you like, the type of imagery that you're trying to produce. But once you have a system in place and you sort of start creating your, your own specific style, it's just a matter of refining and remastering. That's all it is. I have not changed my style in about six or seven years even though the pictures that people see sometimes has a different look. I'm not creating from scratch because I don't have to do that. I'm just building off of what I already know and have done. So that makes it easier as I go forward to where sometimes I can come back to things that are old. And you know, sometimes I'll take something that might, I might've done three, four years ago and decide, you know what? Let me take this because I just thought of something I can create off of this. And that's how I just continue to refine the look that I have. I never get to a place to where I feel like, oh, you know, this, this is it. I don't need to do anything else. This is all. It's, it's about, you know, always continuously challenging yourself and just building off of what you've done. And that's why I also photograph with the exact same lenses. 
all my lenses are all Zeiss lenses for one reason, because every lens is color matched. Why is that important for post-processing? Because when I bring a photo into Lightroom, I can use the same preset across every single image and it will be the same. I don't have to worry about this one manufacturer has a different reproduction as opposed to this one. So you kind of have to make subtle adjustments for one image to the next. I never have to do that because I'm not fighting against one lens to another. So everything is consistent based on what I'm shooting. So that way, as I continue to master my style, I'm not having to master it based on these different characteristics that I'm getting from certain lenses. So that's what makes it easier. And that's why it's for my editing. I actually don't spend a lot of time doing it as, as many people might assume. Wow, thank you very much. That might be the second tip for the day, which is the consistency in the manufacture of lenses, even though you can, when you import into Lightroom, uh, do the lens, you know, do the adjustments for the lens correction, it probably is smarter to just be consistent in your lens choice. Okay, second well, tip. Not necessarily the lens correction, but in uh, kind of uh, something that I don't think I'll hit in this video, but it's the calibration. And I know a lot of people when they go from different brands, Canon, Nikon to Sony or whatever, if you have a, a camera where you're not obtaining the colors that you might like, using the calibration tool is where you would go to kind of get those colors the way that you're, you know, you, you kind of like. And people see that with camera bodies, but they don't ever um, really know that that's a trait of lenses in terms of what you're going to get from that specific uh, camera lens. And so the fact that I'm using color match lenses, I'm going to have the same result. So I don't have to worry about that. You know, if I mix a bodice and a loxia, it's going to be the same in terms of my color. So that way I can use this same preset on a different photo, even if it's taken with a different lens, because the colors are going to be matched across the board. So I'm not fighting against uh, this manufacturer versus that manufacturer, that manufacturer. Because just as important as having a good camera is, your lenses are very essential, especially if you're someone that's going to be doing any kind of post work. Great tip. All right, we've got about 20 minutes left. Why don't you jump into another image? All right, so we're going to go to this one. So let's get back on that virtual plane and head back to New York. And we'll actually go on a subway train here. So what we're going to do is now this is this is one that's kind of a little bit different from the other two nothing really stands out in terms of colors per se but what am I looking at here and and what my eye goes to is the color of the lighting and then the lady that's in the middle so what color palette am I sort of getting out of that what do I see I see that as sort of like a, a daylight watercolor bluish type tone that I'm getting as a cast in this image. So I keep that in my mind as that is going to be my focus and what I'm centered around. Now, some people might might have seen, you know, might go for you see some of these orange tones, um, like the sleeve here, and then of course the people, you kind of have that tone. There is a second edit that I did off of this to where I just saw other things as I was doing this photo. And that's the beauty of photography. You might have one edit one day, but come back maybe a few months later, maybe even a couple years later, you might say, oh, let me go back to this photo and do something different. So today we're gonna do something different. Uh, for this, because I've mentioned those cooler tones, that's the focus, coolness. So with our white balance, we're actually gonna take that a little bit more cool. About, let me go to even three, 3,300 there. And then we'll take out a little bit of our purple tint there. Okay. Now for our exposure, I wanna increase a little bit on our exposure. That looks good. Take out some of the contrast there. We'll bring down our highlights. She, as you notice, that's a sort of a trend here. I have decreased my highlights just about every single photo so far. The reason being, what I normally do is if I decrease 
anything of, of like, if I decrease highlights, I'm usually gonna increase the whites. If I go up in my shadows, I'm usually going to decrease the blacks. Normally that's how it goes 99% of the time. Uh, and the reason for that is because in decreasing highlights, I, I sort of bring down the overall light intensity to where you'll start seeing those, those edges better. And then I just bring the light back with the white level. So that, that way I'm, I'm not losing any of those, those edges because that's very specific to my style. So we'll go and add a little bit of shadows here. We'll add some white and then we'll decrease our black. That looks good. And then we'll add a little bit in texture. We'll add a little bit in clarity just to emphasize those edges. See how we're, we're starting to get those edges really, really sharp? That's where that's coming from. Okay, next is our tone curve that um, Mr. Patrick had mentioned. So we're going to select the point curve. And this time we're going to use my skyline curve strong uh, point curve. And so as you can see, that's a very, very uh, contrasty tone curve. And so with that, we're gonna go back to our par parametric curve here. And we're going to bring our shadows all the way up here. And ever slightly, we'll just decrease a little bit in the dark and make a few adjustments in that. And that's good, okay. So next is our HSL. Now, remember I mentioned those cool colors. So we're going to adjust our aqua and I want that all the way to the blue side this time and have our blue come a little bit into that sort of turquoise color. So see how we've just changed the lighting? I kind of want that watercolor. I think that looks kind of cool. That looks kind of cool. Okay. So we'll make a few adjustments in our other colors that we have here because we're actually not muting any of the colors. So it's a little bit different this time again. So add a little bit of more orange in our reds, a little bit more yellow in the orange. Yellow can stay the same. Green, go a little bit more into a little bit more harsher tone of the greens. And our magentas, we'll increase that over to a little bit more on the reddish tone side and maybe a little bit in the purple. Okay. Now for our saturation, we'll increase that for our reds, our green, go quite a bit in the green. And for our aqua, we'll keep that the same, but our blue, we're gonna take that out just ever so slightly. Take out a little bit of blue. We don't want it too, too heavy because we, we want everything to be very, very smooth, very, it, to, to, for everything to really blend together. So we don't want anything to really stand out too much here. So next for our luminance, we will go quite a bit in the red, quite a bit on our orange. Because as you can see, that adjusts our uh, skin tones there. So we will increase that a little bit, add a little bit of light into the face. And we will add a little bit in the green. That looks pretty good. Okay. So the next, we're actually going to be using color grading, but we're going to keep it in a split toning um, setting. So we'll go back to 100 on our blending. And this time for our shadows, we're going to adjust uh, more in our watercolors there, greenish blues, and add a little bit of saturation. So yeah, we're starting to change that photo. Just color grading is powerful. I love it, love this, this new tool. And then we'll also do the same for our highlights. And so we will come in a little bit to that and add a little bit in the highlights. And that looks pretty good. Now, this time though, let's bring down the balance a bit. That's about negative 30. That looks good. That looks pretty good. Now, again, super sharp photo. I won't add sharpness this time. I've done it twice. Let's not do that there. We'll keep it as is. As far as our lens correction, we'll enable profile correction. Now watch what happens with that vignette that I mentioned before. See how it drastically brightened the side? but we're going to take that back off because I love that. We, we want that to, to be added in our photo. 
So we're going to keep that there. Next, we'll run our transform tool, kind of level it off. Uh, not sure, I oh, guess it didn't have to do that, okay. And next with our effects, and of course, do that post crop vignette, start that off a bit, bring our midpoint all the way to zero. We'll go down quite a bit over here in our amount. And then I want you to watch the lady's hand here. So keep that in mind there, keep that in mind. So now we're gonna bring up the highlights because we don't wanna lose the light from the actual light of the train. We actually want that to still be in our photo. And then we'll feather that and we'll adjust our roundness a bit, to kind of open that up ever so slightly. Okay, so then next, what I want to do is go back to my radio filter. And remember I said, watch, watch this arm. So we're going to bring that out about maybe there. That looks pretty good. So we're going to reset our exposure there and we're going to increase our shadows and that's it. So we'll go to about, you know, about 30 or so. That looks good. That way we, we kind of balance back out her, her whole arm there. So that way it all makes more sense. And um, I think that looks pretty good. So here's our before and there's our after. Any questions that anyone has after that one? No questions at present. Guys, if you have questions, throw them in the chat pod. What a difference on that. And you guys in the chat pod, I put a link to the um, Lightroom page because Kenneth Hines image is the uh, kind of the marquee image that's used in the new version of Lightroom. And I failed to mention that at the beginning, but wanted to make sure you guys know that that's his. So check it out. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathy. And okay, well, I think we got time for this one last image. And we'll stay in New York. We'll come above ground for the first time of New York of our New York tour and go to Times Square. Um, so it's a very vibrant image, of course. And uh, this is one that is actually a brand new photo that I just took about a week and a half ago in in New York. And um first kind of experience with the new Sony Alpha 1 uh, with the Zeiss Otis 28, I think that was. So very, very sharp photo and 50 megapixels at that. So we had a lot of information there. So what am I going to focus on this time? Because there's just so much going on. Well, I kind of want to, if you look at the bottom part of this image, it's like, it doesn't really add much to it. So we don't always have to have that being you know, a dominating part of our image. So we wanna make the image darker and kind of let these billboards and the buildings just stand out on their own. We want those colors to really pop. So what we're going to do is for our white balance, well, first let's, let's uh, straighten up this image a little bit. There we go, that looks a lot better. It looks a lot better. So we'll run through this, give our, our temperature there, a little bit more of a cooler look. And that looks pretty good. We'll keep our tint where it is. And again, here we go with those highlights, We're bringing down the highlights, increasing the shadows though quite a bit. This is probably the most I've gone here in our shadows for the basic. And our whites are gonna stay the same, but then we're really gonna decrease that black level. That looks pretty good. Now, we're gonna emphasize a lot more of our detail here with the texture and clarity. So I want to add quite a bit in texture, quite a bit in, in the clarity. That looks good. So if we kind of hover around, kind of see how we're just kind of exaggerating those edges even further. So next thing we'll go down to our tone curve. And we're going to use my Skyline Curve Strong again. And adds a little bit more contrast in there. And we'll make some adjustments here. The only thing we're adjusting is just our shadows, but we're not taking that all the way to 100 this time, just three fourths of the way, 75%. That looks pretty good. Dial that down, dial that up a bit. 
that looks good. And now HSL. So what we're going to do is bring down our yellows. Or I'm sorry, not bring down our yellows, but shift them more towards the orange hue. We'll bring a little bit more green into our green. For our aqua, add a little there, more towards the blue. Go more towards the turquoise for blue. Looks good. Magenta, go a little bit more red. Purple, go a little bit more up there too. For saturation though, now because blue is kind of like taken over here, we can take out some of that here. We don't need as much, don't need as much. Uh, for our purple, we'll come down a little bit out of those and our magenta. Now our aqua will increase a little bit of that. Green will sig significantly increase. And we'll also do the same for our orange. And that looks pretty good. For our illuminance, kind of dial down some of the colors and maybe increase others. Do that for our, increase our orange, increase the greens a bit, decrease the blue a bit, and also our purple. Okay. So then next, we will come down to our split. Oh, I'm sorry, not split toning, color grading. So we'll go into shadows and we'll go into more of a more of a warmer color tone here. And just add a little bit, not a lot, not a lot at all. And then we'll actually, for the first time, we'll add in some mid tones. So let's add a little bit of the red, red orange here. And we'll add in quite a bit of that to our photo. And because we actually want it to still act as split toning, we'll bring that back to 100. And then we'll go over to our highlights and go about in our yellow range for our hue there. And we'll bring in our saturation. That looks pretty good. OK. And then next, we'll come down to our lens correction. We'll run that. And since this is not a native lens, we actually have to look for it. And this is the Zeiss Otis 28ZE lens. And I'm actually not correcting the vignetting because there is none. There, there was none on this lens. And so next, we've already done our transform. We'll come down to our effects. So what I want to do here, keep our highlight priority, bring that down to about 40, 50, bring in our midpoint, bring up the highlights here. See how we brought in that, we didn't lose that down in the, the, the street. So see how all of that light is muted with our post crop, but in bringing back highlights down there, we add that light back so that way we don't lose that. So just a great tip, if you're utilizing the post crop vignette with the highlight priority and you have those highlights on your edges, activate the highlight so that way your vignette um, is, is not affecting that with, with the highlights. So next we're going to feather this and then we'll change our roundness ever so slightly there. And then there we go. There's our before and after of Times Square. Again, an amazing difference in the before and after. The, the, your after is so much more dramatic. I, to me, the, the left just looks almost like a snapshot and the right really becomes a compelling image. So thank you for, again, showing us how you create your uh, and, great images. And that's as people can see, it's like we kind of got that asphalt look back in the edit of turning that back to, to black. Because, um, you know, this was shot about blue hour. So that's how come the image is so blue um, in the original raw file. And because that lighting change is so drastic, you know, it just that's the color tone that it had bouncing off building. But very simple, very easy to, to go about um, doing that. Well, thank you very much. Does anybody have any last questions before we wrap up? And I will stop my share there and I am back here. <laughs> no questions? Because uh, I think you did such a great job of explaining. Nobody has any questions, which is a testament to you. So thank you. 
Well, I certainly appreciate that. And um, I, I try to be as, as descriptive on everything as I possibly can. And, and um, so hopefully it was helpful. People saw features of the program that they might have not utilized before. Because Lightroom is a very, very powerful tool. <laughs> um, and just uh, why don't you tell everyone how they can watch more of your educational videos on YouTube? So people can visit my website at professorhines, H-I-N-E-S dot com. Um, and I have links to my YouTube channel there, Professor Hines' Choice, where I do kind of like this live, where I have many of my pictures, many popular images that I've had that people have wanted to see edits of, of that they can pull up and see me go through the whole workflow, um, as well as, you know, follow me on Instagram at Professor Hines. Everything is the same name, so it's very easy to find me. And there's, you know, if there's any questions people have, I'm always there to answer them. There's no secrets to my work. I teach and share everything that I do. So even if you think it's something I might not share, just ask it because I might surprise you and we'll answer that question. Well, great. Thank you very much for everything you've done today. There are a lot of thank yous and compliments in chat about how clear um, you are to, to understand how people can follow along and how impressed they are with your work present company included. So thank you very much everyone who attended today and thank you Kenneth for the great educational session and everyone go enjoy the rest of your day and have a good weekend. Bye for now.